Good morning, Austin Oaks Church. Is that better? All right, a little technical difficulties on my part. Uh, we're so glad to have you here this morning. Happy Mother's Day to all of you. Uh, and all you mothers out there, we're thankful for all of you and just want you to be blessed today uh, as a special day for you all. I also want to just talk about our home church sites a little bit. This week, we kicked off a few of our home church sites. So if you're out there, a shout out to you home church sites across our city this morning. We're super excited about that. We really want you to snap a picture. So take a picture of your people worshiping together uh, and engaging together this morning. Uh, send it to us or or even post it on the live chat section of it so we can all kind of share that and see we have four different home sites that are kicking off this weekend. And then next week, we're going to be launching a bunch more of those sites. So you can sign up. We'll have more information for you. A uh, shout out for you to find a site near you to do that. Uh, today, we really wrap up a series we've been in for the last four weeks. It's a series titled, What's After ATX, or What's After Austin? What happens after our life here in Austin? And this is a real unique series because uh, its launching point is based off some uh, medical research that's been done on what's called near-death experiences. And there's a number of books that have come out now from medical researchers, doctors who really didn't even oftentimes believe in an afterlife, but have now come across so many experiences of people who have had what's called a near-death experience, where their heart has stopped, brain waves have been flatlined, and, uh, and they're working on them and doing whatever they can, and after some period of time, they're resuscitated and brought back, and they have this experience of something after life that's really unexplainable to the doctors and to the medical science field. And it's people from all different backgrounds. That's what's so fascinating about it. Whether they're from a Western culture, an Eastern culture, uh, all over the world, whether their religious background is unique or different, it doesn't really matter their culture, their race, or the region of the world in which they happen to live they all tend to have some very common experiences and explain things in much the same way. And in this journey, if you're new with us, one of the things we've looked at and what's so fascinating about it is when you compare these experiences uh, to all the major religions in the world, what's fascinating of, of the 40 common experiences that these NDEers have, 38 of them are clearly described in the scriptures, in the Bible, the Christian writings. No other religion even comes close. Three or four, maybe five at best, described in other major religions. But Christianity talks about 38 of those 40 experiences that pe these people describe. So today we're going to look at one of those uh, and our final one today called a life review. The experience that many of them had of their life, in a sense, being played before them, uh, somewhat like a movie and a figure of light, a loving figure of light that's talking to them about the impact of every interaction they've had in their life and the ripple effect it had, good and bad, on the people around them. So let's pray, and we're going to dive into this message about a life review. Father God, we're thankful for this time. Uh, even though it's an uncertain time for us, it's a time when uh, everyone has lots of questions and uh, people just don't seem to have the right answers or what's right for one day or one week is being changed uh, the next week. Lord, that raises a lot of uncertainty in people, a lot of concern and a lot of anxiety at times. Uh, in particular, Lord, when we begin to realize just how fragile this life is, how a teeny tiny little virus can literally turn our world upside down. But Lord, you've told us that this world is pretty fragile in a lot of ways already, and that this world is not our permanent spot. So Lord, as we uh, open your word and as we just look at these unique things that we're hearing about in near-death experiences, um, I pray that you would strengthen our hearts to see beyond this life. Uh, see past something that every single one of us is going to experience. It's 100% true of every person we've ever met. We're going to die. So what happens next, Lord? Please open our hearts and our minds and, and give us a perspective that sees things the way you see them. And I ask this in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
It was January 4th, 1992. Uh, I can still remember the day almost as if it was yesterday. Uh, my wife and I, uh, who had just been married uh, for six months, uh, we were sitting in the living room of our first apartment together uh, when the phone rang. So I walked over, picked up the phone, uh, only to find out it was the coroner from Steamboat Springs, Colorado. And he was informing me that my older brother, Chris, had been killed in a plane crash. He hadn't been able to get a hold of my parents and was trying to track down a relative, and I was the first one he was able to come up with. And as, as that whole thing, situation, as more information came out, I, I came to to be found out that the pilot uh, had an expired license, so he wasn't even supposed to be flying. Uh, the plane was way overweight, and he'd been warned multiple times by those in that small little airport that he shouldn't take off, and yet he proceeded anyways. And on that day of that little eight-passenger plane, three of those eight passengers were killed. The pilot was one of them. And I wrestled, I was angry for a while, thinking it just doesn't seem fair. No one could be held responsible for that event. It just seemed like someone should have to, to be held accountable, be responsible for that. And, and so it just seemed wrong. It seemed incomplete. It seemed unsolvable in some ways. Let me ask you a question, though. Can you think of a time when something like that happened in your life where you were mistreated or some injustice came about in your life and it just wasn't resolved the way you felt it should be resolved? How did that feel? Uh, it may have been a, a family member uh, that, that caused that pain. It could have been a coworker, a friend. It could have been the guy down the street that you know, never pulls his garbage cans up and his lawn is always unkept and unmowed and it just drives you crazy. It seems like no one is going to hold him accountable for his actions. It may be um, a politician that just doesn't seem to follow through on his or her promises. Or maybe it was a spouse who walked out on you at the worst possible moment. See, the truth be told, every single one of us has situations like this in our life where it just seems like someone should be held accountable, and yet they're not. In the heart of every person is the need for accountability. It's a tiny scale of justice, I think, that, that sits in each of our hearts that just says something isn't right here. Something needs to be fixed. We all want people to be held responsible for their actions. But what if they really are? What if our life does count and we will actually see it for what it is? Interestingly enough, a significant number of near-death experiencers or NDEers report just that. Well over 23% say that at some point in their near-death experience, they have what's uh, been termed a, a life review, where their life is flashed before their eyes and, and someone is explaining to them the impact of every single event that they experience in their life, both good and bad. Uh, if there really is that moment, uh, then what would that look like for us? So watch this video for yourself and hear from some of these people as they describe this unique experience called a life review. My life flashes in front of me as big as the sky. And it was right then and there, God and I began to look at my life. One of the most life-changing aspects of this experience for many people is what they call their life review. They watch their life replayed in this panoramic vision of every scene, and they see the ripple effect of their little acts of kindness or the things that weren't so kind. They come back knowing that how we treat each other, how we love each other, that's what matters most. My life was laid bare for all its good and bad, and Jesus was showing me this and saying, look at how that event impacted this person, that impacted that person, that impacted that person. 
22.2% of near-death experiencers have a fascinating phenomenon known as life review. At this time, they may see a part or even all of their prior life. It's often described as flashing before them like on a screen. I saw an image that flashed into my mind, and I was 11 years old, and I was kneeling at a uh, church summer camp. Man, I was sincere. I was reliving every moment. It was almost as we were watching the film of my life. And everything I had did in secret and open, good or bad, everything, every detail of my life was flashing right before me. I'm seeing these, these moments from my life like I'm watching them. And it was the moments I had with my dad growing up, throwing the football, just being a kid, just a son and his father. really is a moment after life uh, when our life is reviewed, uh, what would the standard be for that review? I mean, we live in a, a day and age where, I mean, don't you hear a lot of phrases like this a lot, you know, to each their own, or you do you and let me do me, or if it's all relative, you know, everyone's entitled to their own truth, let their truth be their truth, but, but do we really believe that? I mean, can we really believe that? Robert Bella's influential work titled Habits of the Heart speaks of the expressive individualism that dominates American culture. And in his book, Bella states the following. He says, 80% of Americans agree with the statement, an individual should arrive at his or her own religious beliefs independent of any church or synagogue. And he concludes that the most fundamental belief in American culture is that moral truth is relative to individual consciousness. He concludes that our culture, therefore, has no problem with a God of love who supports us no matter how we live. It does, however, object strongly to the idea of a God who will judge or evaluate people for their sincerely held beliefs, even if they're mistaken. So let me ask you, could I walk away from the plane crash that killed my brother uh, simply saying, well, you know, that pilot, I mean, he didn't believe that a license was all that important. And he certainly, it wasn't true for him that a, an overweight plane wasn't a good thing to take off that day. Could believing that his truth is different than mine really settle that struggle that was going on in my heart? And my question to you is the same. In situations where you've been hurt or you've been treated unjustly, is it simple enough to just say, well, their truth is different than mine, and who am I to judge? See, the reality is we all have our own personal standard in our hearts and mind. And do we really believe that every person is entitled to their own truth, thus allowing them to act however they wish. Let me illustrate this in a, in a simple way, maybe using a sports or a sporting event as sort of a microcosm of life. In a sporting event, let's say it's a game of football, uh, there are rules that guide that game. In fact, you might say that there are individual truths that are true for that event to take place. If you were to project onto that sport the same kind of individualism that we've begun to adopt in the West, what would it like to, be, to watch a sporting event in which every player on that field had a different truth or a different set of rules for how they played the game? Would it even be fun to watch if one person says, no, I get seven points just by crossing the 10 yard line, or if I run out of bounds, I get 20 points for that. Another one has a totally different rule that says, no, you know, you don't get any points no matter what you do. I mean, how would you watch a game like that? Would it be entertaining at all? How would you score it? How would you even evaluate what's taking place on the field? The fact is, there's not one sporting event we've ever watched, nor is there any game, nor is there really any arena in life, workplace or home, that operates the way we often talk about with total relative truth or even great variations in truth. Instead, wouldn't it seem best if there is a clear standard that applied to everyone irregardless? 
and was created by someone, let's say, who created the game of life. Maybe there is. In fact, I want to take some time now and look at these experiences uh, through the lens of the Bible that talks about some of these very things that it seemed to be experienced by these uh, NDEers now, but these authors of the scriptures wrote about it well over 2,000 years ago. So if you have a Bible, look at Romans, or excuse me, Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. And in this passage, verses 11 through 15, it'll come up on the screen for you if you don't have a Bible, but you can open up yours if you have one with you. In Revelation chapter 20, we're going to see that the writers of the Bible wrote of a life review that's consistent with what these NDEers were experiencing. They wrote about it far earlier than any of these experiences ever came about. And is it possible that what's happening in some of these people is simply a small taste or the beginnings of something that we've known about or could know about for quite some time. Listen to what the author of Revelation, John, says about this. He says in verse 11, then I saw a great white throne and one seated on it. So a throne uh, in that time was like a judgment or a place where a judge would sit. So he's depicting this vision of a great white throne and one seated on it and earth and heaven fled from his presence and no place was found for them. I also saw the dead, the great and the small, mark that, I saw the dead, the great and the small, meaning the significant people in the world's eyes and those who maybe were just overlooked, all are there, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged according to their works by what was written in the books. Meaning these books had all these people's works, everything that they'd ever done was right there, written down. Then the sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. Each one was judged according to their works. Death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. There are two things I think are important for us to see that this passage is communicating. Two things that are made very clear. The first one comes in the first two verses, verse 11 and 12. And that's that every single person, great or small, will face a judgment or review of their life. Every single person. That's actually really comforting if you stop and think about it. In particular, for the common person who doesn't have that much means or significance in this present world and doesn't have the ability to use their money, their resources, their power to influence the many systems in this world that often get them favoritism when it comes to things like this. This passage shows that whether you're the most significant person in the world or maybe someone that no history book will ever write about, you're going to have your day before the perfect judge. And every wrong that's ever happened in this world will be evaluated. And every right, even those not seen by those so-called significant people in this world. That's the first thing we see here, which is exactly what a lot of these NDEers are explaining in their experience. The second thing we see in this passage is also very important. And that is there's a group of people who will be sent to what's called the lake of fire or as commonly expressed as hell. It's not a, a pleasant place. You can say, oh, come on, Chad. I mean, hell, isn't that some kind of like medieval construct that, that religious people in that day created to scare people into doing what they wanted them to do? What's interestingly uh, is that 23% of these NDEs or near-death experiences, 23% of the people that have actually spoken about their near-death experience, which is over thousands of people that have done this, 23% of them ex speak of a hellish experience. And you know what's even more fascinating? If those people that speak of it are not often those who are Christians, who have even study the scriptures and know about it themselves, who have created that construct in their mind to somehow imagine this experience. 
They're actually people who don't believe it before they have this experience. Watch this video. I'm now down, descending lower and lower into nothingness. And I just keep falling and falling and falling. It feels like somebody grabs me and drops me in this outer darkness. And I start racing down this black tunnel. And so as I'm going down, the next thing that comes to my head is, oh my God, I, I died and I'm going to hell. The people encircled me and kind of started leading me. As we journeyed, I'm aware I can't see anything anymore. It's pitch black. One study done of people who reported near-death experiences, and 23% actually had hellish experiences. So not every near-death experience is uh, blissful. At this point, I'm feeling more and more anxiety, more and more uh, pain than I even I, I felt on my worst day alive. There was no doubt in my mind, the hell of the Bible, this is where I am, this is where I'm gonna be forever. It's almost like there's an absence of hope, there's an absence of love, it's the absence of God. So I said, I'm not going any further. And they said, oh, yes, you are. So they started to tug at me and push at me. And then that became biting and tearing. And they were taking pieces of me. In my study of these hellish near-death experiences, I am impressed what a high percentage of people go on to make positive changes in their life. They become better people. They learn to face that fear, guilt, anger, those negative things they were dealing with in their life before they had that experience. I get to this place of desperation where I cry out to the Lord, and all of a sudden, the Spirit of the Lord comes down, and I feel the presence of God. So it's at this point that many people complain that, that the people who believe in a God of judgment uh, will be hateful and judgmental themselves. And, and that's certainly been true. A lot of people who believe in a God of judgment have done just that. Even though that should not be the normal result of that, that's just the result of human behavior in general. All of us can be naturally like that. If you believe in a, a God who smites evildoers, they'll often say, you may think it's perfectly just to go and do the same thing yourself and start smiting people who think differently than you do. But let me share with you one uh, theologian's thoughts that actually turn that upside down and show us why the belief in a God who is judging is the only possible way that we can not be judgmental and not vengeful ourselves. Miroslav Volf, who is a Croatian uh, and a theologian, has seen the violence in the Balkans. He's experienced incredible violence, even more so than what we often have experienced in our more protected society here in the West. And these are his statements on this. And he does not see the doctrine of God's judgment in that way in any way. He writes this, and I quote, If God were not angry at injustice and deception and did not make a final end to violence, that God would not be worthy of worship. The only means of prohibiting all recourse to violence by ourselves is to insist that violence is legitimate only when it comes from God. In fact, in this fascinating passage, Wolf reasons that it is the lack of belief in a God of vengeance that secretly nourishes violence. The human impulse to make perpetrators of violence pay for their crime is almost an overwhelming one. And it cannot be overcome with some of the common platitudes and phrases that we often throw out like this. Now, don't you see that violence won't solve anything? If you've seen your home burn down, when you've watched your family and children be killed and raped and murdered right before your eyes, a simple platitude like that will never deal with what's going on in your heart. Can our desire for justice be honored in a way that does not nurture vengeance? Wolf says the best resource for this belief is in the concept of a God who does bring ultimate justice. In fact, he says this, and I quote, if I don't believe there is a God who will eventually put all things right, I will take up the sword and will be sucked into the endless vortex of retaliation. 
only if I am sure that there is a God who will right all wrongs and settle all accounts perfectly do I have the power from retraining to do so myself. But the God spoken about in the Bible is not simply a God bringing justice to evil. Uh, That would be an inaccurate caricature of who God is and how he's portrayed in the Bible. That really what he is is he is one who will bring justice, but more so, he's a God that longs to reward those whom he loves. Justice is just to remove evil and all the hurt and suffering that all of us realize, no matter our background, just seems to be something wrong in this world. But this same God who is going to right those wrongs is one who is waiting and longing to reward you and anyone who will trust him. Let me show you some other passages in the Bible that capture this aspect of them. The writers of the Bible speak of a God who loves to reward those who trust in him. Hebrews 11.6 is one of the most comprehensive passages and simple on this very concept. It's at the very core of believing in this God of the Bible. Listen to what it says. It says, Now without faith it is impossible to please God. And now he's going to go on and describe what that faith looks like. Since the one who draws near to him, meaning the one who wants to draw near to God, must believe, that's faith, that he exists. That's the first thing. We must believe that a God exists. And then there's another thing that's a pillar to our faith in him. And that he rewards those who seek him. That's God's heart. That captures God's heart better than anything. His justice on evil is not what he desires to give to anyone, but he will do it because he plays no favorites. He will bring about perfect justice for your good and for mine, but his heart is to reward. Let me show you some specifics in which we see that. In Colossians chapter three, we see how he rewards us, or one of the many ways. He says, where Paul is writing to the Colossians, he says, don't work only while being watched, as people pleasers, but work wholeheartedly fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, do it from the heart as someone, something done for the Lord and not for people, knowing that you will receive the reward of an inheritance from the Lord. You serve the Lord Christ. I love that passage because it tells us that your wholehearted work, when you do your work as unto God or or someone bigger than your boss and the people around you that we're so often clamoring for their attention and we need their accolades and all that stuff, God's saying, hey, don't even worry about them. Yes, serve them faithfully, but you work wholeheartedly as if you're working directly for me because I will reward you regardless of whether anyone acknowledges your efforts or not. That's a pretty great truth. Look at what else we see. In fact, uh, this says exactly the same thing in, in different ways. How many times do we see people jump into religious activities and it just seems like they're doing them to impress other people? God's gonna speak to us in this passage that he wants us to do everything we do and directed to him for his pleasure and for his attention. And he says this uh, in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount when Jesus was teaching, teaches this. He says in Matthew chapter 6, he says, be careful not to practice your righteousness or your religious deeds in front of others to be seen by them. He's not saying we can't do anything in public. He's saying be careful practicing them for the purpose of being seen by other people. And he tells us why. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father in heaven. So whenever you give to the poor, don't sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be applauded by people. Notice where he says these hypocrites are. They're in the religious places. Just because a person traffics in religious places does not make them a follower of God. So important to understand that. And oftentimes Christians are wrongly judged by the actions of people who hang out in religious places, but they're not really worshiping the God whom they claim to worship. The hypocrites and a lot of these religious leaders in Jesus' time were exactly that type. And he's saying they have their reward. He said they want to be applauded by people. 
But he said, truly, I tell you, they have their reward. Meaning, when your reward is, is sought by people, when you want the approval of people, when you want the recognition of people, when you want any reward that people offer, then that's the only reward you'll get. And it'll only last as long as the reward of a person can last. But God says you can seek his word in a different way. He says, when you give to the poor, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. Do you want his reward or do you want the reward of people? He says, whenever you pray, you must not like be, be like the hypocrites because they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by people. Truly, I tell you, they have their reward. There you go again. We can pursue our whole lives the rewards of people or we can pursue God's reward. But when you pray, go into your private room, shut your door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. Whenever you fast, don't be gloomy like the hypocrites for they make their faces unattractive so that their fa fasting is obvious to people. Truly I tell you, they have their reward. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that your fasting isn't obvious to others but to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. You see, you'll be rewarded for seeking God's approval, not people's. And, and this is what's, what makes Christianity so unique, and we're going to talk about this even more. Every other reward we pursue always has an exclusivity to it that rules out and often pushes aside certain groups of people that just don't have the privileges or the background or the education or they're not in the right race for that situation or they don't have the right amount of money to be in that group because all those rewards are the rewards of people. People evaluate other people and give rewards based on their own broken standards. And my guess is You've been hurt by that exact same thing yourself. You've been excluded from certain acknowledgments and rewards of people because anytime our rewards are simply based on our own judgment, we're going to create our own circles and we're going to push and move people out. But did you catch what I saw in this passage? That God could care less who acknowledges what we do in this world. In fact, his rewards are just the opposite. They're done when no one's watching. You receive them when no one is aware of what you've done. In total secret. There is not a person on earth, race, background, socioeconomic, culture, part of the world, that cannot walk in the rewards that God is offering. Nothing can exclude you from them because they're not the praise of people but God. Listen to this last one before we talk more specifically about how you can receive these rewards. Jesus said in Matthew 16, he said, for the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will reward each according to what he has done. See, God is putting your rewards aside. Every time you do what pleases him, another reward is there for you. He wants you pursuing him. And when Jesus comes back, when God says he's going to make all things right at the end of time, Jesus will come with his reward and your reward in his hands. And he is waiting to offer it to you. So what if this God spoken of in the Bible and seemingly experienced by those describing their near-death experiences will evaluate every one of our lives? Just what if? Let's just suspend your doubts for a moment. And if you're in a spot where you just think, I don't believe there's a God or I don't believe it'll be evaluated like that, I just want you to just set that aside and just go on this what if with me. What if that's true? I have two questions that I want to leave you with. Two questions that I think will penetrate your heart and cause you to answer or think of life in one of two ways. Either life is absolutely meaningless, which if that's your truth, 
then really there's no purpose in anything that you do. Or life does have purpose and it will be evaluated. Here's the first question. To believe your life won't be evaluated is to believe your life doesn't count. Let me say that again. To believe your life won't be evaluated is to believe your life doesn't count. I mean, how would you feel about a college class? You sign up for a college class and your professor says, hey, in my class there's no homework. Uh, I don't evaluate anything. I'm not uh, giving you any exams. Nothing you do will have any impact at all on, on this class. H how would you feel about this class? After you got over the initial excitement of, yeah, no exams. But honestly, you know what you'd feel about it. You feel like, like, what's the purpose? Why would I do any of this work if absolutely none of it is going to be evaluated? Or let me lean in a little bit further. Let's say it's your career. What if you had a career that had no desired outcome and zero paycheck at all that went along with it? What would you think about that career? How excited would you be to pursue it? You see, if it's not going to be evaluated, then you can't believe that it counts. Everything that counts is evaluated. That's the whole point, that it's got to be measured by some kind of standard. The second question is this, to believe your life does count is to believe your life will be evaluated. There's no other way. But the challenge here is this, to believe your life will be evaluated means you gotta come to grips with something that you and I both know is true. That whatever standard you use, you fall short. In fact, this belief to believe your life matters, leading to it being evaluated, can be incredibly unnerving. Because even if you get to choose the standard, as many of us Americans think we can, you won't even measure up to that standard. In fact, let me just perform a little thought experiment from you, for you. Let's, let's pretend I had a little invisible recorder that the moment you were born, I wrapped it around your neck. You couldn't see it, couldn't feel it, didn't know it was there, but every single time you made a statement in life that evaluated something, that commented about another person, and set kind of some kind of standard. Every statement that you ever made in life that somehow set a standard was recorded on that recorder. And you come to the end of your life and someone grabs that recorder and says, okay, Chad, you don't believe there's any standard. You don't believe anyone else can evaluate your life, that you lived your own truth and you did you the best you could. So here's your recorder. It's recorded everything that you say is true or believe about other people or what other people should be doing. It's right here on this recorder. And what we're going to do today is we're just going to evaluate your life based on your own personal standard. And they started to play that recorder of everything that you've ever said. How would you do? And be honest. I think you know the same as I, that you would fail that test miserably. And so here's the tension we live with. The reason we often don't want to believe our lives will be evaluated is because we know we'd never measure up. And church, this is why Christianity sets itself apart from every other religion, every other belief. It reveals to us that life does count, that someone is evaluating your life and will hold everyone to account because life matters. Your life matters. My life matters. In spite of our mistakes, life has a purpose. Yet it also provides the most profound, life-changing, and non-discriminatory way for you to have a life and me to have a life that does measure up. The fact that Jesus Christ lived and walked on this earth, that's indisputable. No scholar, whether they 
vehemently reject Christianity or not, no historical scholar denies that Jesus Christ lived and breathed and walked on this earth. And even the fact that Jesus taught these things, many that we talked about today, and lived according to them and was crucified, no one rejects that. That's pretty much historical fact. So let me just ask you to consider something then. And think about this. Jesus wasn't an accomplished political leader. He never held a political office, never ran for office. Jesus wasn't a world-class athlete. He wasn't a movie star. He wasn't a famous musician. He wasn't a world-renowned scientist. He didn't pursue or hold or in any acknowledge religious positions or platforms. There was nothing significant in this world about his life. In fact, it's really just the opposite. And historical facts prove this as well. He came from an incredibly humble, even poor background. Yet name one other leader, just, just one, even close, who's had the influence on people and even over history like Jesus. Just name one. In fact, I'd be willing to bet you can't even name someone within the last 200 or 300 years that's had anywhere close to the impact that Jesus has had in humanity. And he's over 2,000 years ago that he walked. He came from no position of power. He pursued no position of power. And he held no position of power or influence in this world. Yet arguably, no one has been more influential in history than him. Who could possibly do that? Who could possibly not have any place of power or influence in this world and yet still be the most influential person? Maybe God? Maybe the one who created this world and then sent his own son in the person of Jesus Christ to redeem it. And here's the kicker and what many of us miss. Jesus did not come just to be an example to us. He didn't come to just be an example for us because if he was an example, it would leave us still broken and falling short of the standard. Jesus came to be a substitute for you and for me. That's why he came. He lived a perfect life, always pleasing God, not seeking any of these things that we just talked about are so important to us. He sought one thing, to please his Father who sent him to earth to make it possible for you and I to receive the greatest reward this world could ever know, a relationship with the God who created it. Yet after Jesus accomplished this, He had another task he came to do, to die for the sin and selfishness that every human being has demonstrated by seeking the approval of people or even ourselves. His death on the cross was his willingness to be judged for your selfishness and for mine. The Apostle Paul, whom history tells us was responsible for the murder of the very first Christian, this guy murdered the first Christian, eventually realized the same truth that we're talking about today. And it totally changed his life. God used this man, this murderer, to actually write most of the New Testament. And one of the things he wrote is maybe the most concise statement in the book of 2 Corinthians about this very truth I'm sharing with you right now. He says this in verse 21 of chapter 5. He, meaning God, made the one, that's Jesus, I'm just giving you it in its context. So God made the one who is Jesus, who did not know sin, meaning Jesus was sinless. He did everything right in the Father's eyes. The only person who ever walked this earth. He, God, made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. It's just Paul using a simple little metaphor to say that he became the outcome of our sin. He became death. 
he became judged. All the wickedness, all the suffering, all the brokenness of sin, Jesus became that for you and for me. Why? So that in him, we might become the righteousness of God. You could just say this, God wanted us to have the reward that only his son deserved, Jesus, the righteousness that he deserved. And Jesus said, I'm willing to go and pay the price for a standard they could not meet. I'll go meet that standard, and then I'll accept the consequences of their failure to meet it so that they can accept the consequences of my perfect, sinless life. The reason he died for us was, the, was so we could receive the righteousness that he deserved. We could receive the record of his life. So let me put it this way real plainly. You mean, Chad, like if I murdered someone and then later came to realize that Jesus Christ died for my forgiveness and to offer his life for mine, then I would be accepted by God just as if I lived like Jesus. Yep. If I'm a drug addict and cheated, lied, and stole, even from those closest to me, people who, who have loved me and been faithful to me, and I cheated and, and swindled them to get the drugs that I'm addicted to, and then suddenly I realize that Jesus Christ died for that, and now his life is how my life will be evaluated before God, then, then I'll have that relationship? Yep. You mean if I've walked out on multiple marriages, have strings of broken promises to people around me, and all of a sudden I come to faith in Jesus Christ, I trust that he substituted his life for mine. Now suddenly my sins are forgiven, and when God evaluates me, he'll evaluate me based on Jesus' record and not mine? Is that what you're saying, Chad? That's exactly what I'm saying. In fact, it's not what I'm saying. It's what God has said over and over and over again. God made him who didn't sin at all to become your sin so that he could offer you the reward that only Jesus deserved. So how do I get that reward? The Bible's very clear. Believe in him. That word means to trust. Trust that Jesus is who he said he is and that he did for you what he said he did for you. Yeah, but Amy, I don't mean to clean up my life and change my life first. No, in fact, it's just the opposite. You can't clean up your life. You cannot be any different than our brokenness will ever produce until you start this new life in Jesus Christ. It's not when you get over your drug addiction. It's not when you reconcile with all those broken relationships. It's not when you somehow make amends for everything that you did. It's when you recognize you can't and that he did that for you and you trust him. And when you do that, trust me, he's going to come in, he's going to take up residence, and he's going to change everything about you that you know is broken. That's what he does. That's what he's best at. That's why he came to a broken world to offer you life. If you have more questions about this whole Jesus person, I get that. It's a huge decision. I want to encourage you to just email us. Fill out a communication card. Let us know. Uh, we're here to help you on that journey. I've walked that journey myself. I've had my own things that kept me from trust in Jesus until I realized I could never change my life myself. And I can honestly tell you I'm far from perfect but he's changed so many things in my life. And it's so true to even what we read about these characters in the Bible that I know he'll do the same 
for you. If you've heard what you've needed and you want to trust Christ today, I'm just going to close right now with a real simple prayer. I need you to know there's nothing magic in this prayer. There's nothing magic about me praying it. The beauty and the power in this prayer is it's your heart, maybe for the first time, having an honest conversation with God and just admitting, I'm broken and my life will not meet my standard nor any other standard. But today I trust that Jesus Christ uh, met that standard. He took my punishment and he offered me his perfect life. That's all we're going to do is pray. Would you just bow your head right where you're at and pray with me? Father God, (laughs) this is one of the most important conversations I may ever have. Father, I recognize that my life, um, I want to believe it has purpose. But yet, to believe it has purpose is to know that it's got to be evaluated by some standard. And yet, I'm so afraid of a standard because I know I can't meet it. But today, Father, I've come to realize something, that, that you are a God who will evaluate my life. But you're also a God so full of grace, so full of mercy, that your own son, Jesus Christ, would come down and take on human flesh, would live a perfect life without sin. And instead of receiving the reward that he deserved at that moment, instead would humbly submit to death on a cross. And Lord, we see only the human side of that death That pales in comparison to the judgment he received from you. A judgment that should have been on all of us, but he graciously and willingly took so that he could offer to us his perfect life. Lord, I trust that today. I don't know what tomorrow brings, I know that doesn't fix everything I've done in my past, but I know it changes my future forever. So Lord, walk with me on the next step as I start by trusting you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.